we had what has now been termed uh, the standard social science model. And the standard social science model was, uh, you've heard this from philosophers and, and, and wise people that you're the sum total of your experiences. So that's, uh, that's the notion. And so I, I certainly sort of vaguely believe that just like anybody else. And so I vaguely believe that, that a, uh, a, major, uh, a major task of clinical psychology was to sort of work on your weaknesses and, you know, uh, sort of get, get yourself up in shape one way or the other uh, uh, psychologically. And so, you know, if you weren't very conscientious, you know, not that we even use that term, but if you weren't, then you'd work on it. Or if you weren't very extroverted, you'd work on it. Uh, if you weren't very smart, you'd work on it. <laughs> In other words, one way or the other, sort of the task of life was to, uh, was this process of improvement and the things that you were improving, uh, there, there was a notion that everything was essentially flexible. And uh, the, uh, and of course, there, there wasn't really any contrary voices to this. And the, the, and the notion was, is that since you're the sum total of your experiences, anybody that walks in your door, if you're a clinician, has the, the trials and tribulations and the hurts that they have. Uh, the reason they're hurting is that they've been injured. You're effectively like an orthopedic physician. Uh, if, they, if, there's, if, if their ankle hurts, then somebody tweaked their ankle. Uh, if they've got a bunch of anxiety, then somebody made them scared. Uh, somebody caused them some kind of damage at some point that's led to, to them having those types of reactions now. And so this is, uh, this is the standard fare, whether it was learning theory that's been around 100 years or it's a little more of a twisted learning theory uh, of the psychodynamic realm. Uh, if, we, if we have a, a Freudian slant on things, then things get a little bit more complicated and fascinating about the reason why you wash your hands because you had overly severe toilet training or something like this. So the, um, anyway, uh, again, like Jen, uh, Jen was having this experience in the 2000s because she's a, a young person that w w was born late. <laughs> if you were born earlier properly in the 1950s, like myself, then when this is all happening, th there, there's literally nobody knows. And so uh, the, the literature that, that Jen would run into that would inform me hadn't been written yet. So I'm going through school in the 1980s, and I am diligently and honestly studying what is known and getting a, a first-rate education uh, at this, so I'm walking out uh, with my PhD in hand, feeling like, okay, that's the way it is. And it's confusing and frustrating. And uh, there was many, uh, there's all kinds of jokes about psychologists, like, uh, you know, how many psychologists does it take to change a light bulb? Just one, but the light bulb has to want to change. You know, <laughs> that's right. the, the, no, the joke right. is. is that it's totally my, it's my old favorite. I love that one. <laughs> <laughs> so the clients, uh, the notion is, is that that's the jaded view that, boy, it sure is hard to get people to change, but, you know, and it's their responsibility. It's not your responsibility and et cetera. So this is the notion that, and get the, what, of what gets derived out of the, the learning theory tradition. And it's going to turn out that the learning theory tradition, for all intents and purposes, is about 90% wrong. Uh, there, there's 10% of it's in there that gets to live, but it's essentially, at its core, it's actually mistaken. So you are not the sum total of your experiences. You are, uh, uh, what you are is you are essentially a more or less fixed genetic entity. Uh, so you, you can no more become somebody's different, uh, different personality or character than you can become a different animal. Uh, in other words, your the individual differences in our DNA are so striking and so important that they actually form the foundation of who it is that we are. And so therefore, strangely and paradoxically, uh, as Jen and I will talk about, 
it turns out that that means that environment is more important than we thought. It means the environment is the only thing that we can change because we can't change ourselves, okay? So in other words, if you approach psychology from the notion that the task of clinical psychology is to change the individual human, uh, which is essentially the widespread view that goes on in clinical psychology today, which is a derivative of the standard social science model. That model is wrong at the core. So Jen and I don't try to seek to change people. We seek to try to figure out what they need to change about their situations to improve their lives. And that, that, is, uh, that is how our, our approach is fundamentally different. And both of us counsel people, uh, essentially life coach, uh, folks in, in, in a wide variety of, of domains of life. Essentially, nothing's off the table about what we're willing to talk about. Uh, and uh, But the purpose of, the, of our analysis is to try to not figure out what went wrong in your childhood that changed you in some negative way so that that's why you're having a negative thing 25 or 30 years later. No, what we're interested in is what's going on right now in your existence who are you fundamentally and why is there a mismatch between who you are fundamentally and the environment that you find yourself in? That winds up being uh, the most uh, important part of the an analytic process that we go through. So, uh, you know, we, we might ask a person about their history, not because we're interested in what damaged you. We're interested in finding out who you are. Okay. So your life history can tell us a great deal about who it is that you are. We're not the slightest bit interested in figuring out how on earth we're going to engineer you to change. We're just trying to figure out how to change your life. Those are two different things. It's beautiful. Yes, this is why I so wished and was, I was unsure how, how to approach to invite you to a dog training podcast and to, to tell my audience if you guys are not getting it yet, but you will see the similarities and you will understand pretty quickly how evolutionary psychology starts from from single cell organism on to, to us. You know, we, we are all biologically programmed to avoid something aversive and approach something that's pleasant. That's, that's just uh, fundamental stuff. And dog training Today, what so many trainers call it modern dog training is still stuck, deeply stuck in the Skinnerian ways of, 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 of thinking and, and Watson and yeah, we can make anything through reinforcement and punishment. We can just, you know, and um, so that's kind of why that conversation will be so interesting for, especially for dog trainers that are truly stuck there. And I hope that it just stimulates them to, to go deeper and, and follow you and get some evolutionary psychology books and, and really get a completely different angle of why we do and what we do and how, what can be changed and what cannot be changed. Because a big problem in dog training is that, um, it's almost the, the ego of the dog trainer. It's like, no, I, I will fix this problem, but not really thinking where the, is it a problem? Where is it coming from? Why is the dog displaying it? All those things. It's like, no, I will reinforce and punish. And if I, it's not working, I'll just do more. <laughs> and, and, and it becomes, it, it's, it's actually sad to some level to watch dogs suffer and trainers getting frustrated just simply because of lack of knowledge and, and exposure to a different views of, of this. And it's really, really, everything comes, I guess it comes from animals and experiments and study with animals back to us, but then it comes back from us to how we train and how we interact with animals. And for whatever reason, we are stuck in the fifties and sixties and including, including people that, uh, have PhDs and graduated, uh, different, different schools. And they, there is still this, no, you, you really can be 
whatever you want. You just need to, as you said, Dr. Ryle, you just, you got to try harder. You're just not putting enough. So, um, <laughs> but this is um, um, the whole evolutionary psychology. Of course, you, we, I mean, we cannot disregard reinforcement and punishment. It's just the fact is that we cannot change something that, it's against your genetic makeup. And, and the best way to deal with it is to understand why is it there, when it's gonna display itself, and can we guide it in some direction that it's, it's beneficial for us, right? <laughs>